both ministers uh, for those remarks. Uh, I, I know we uh, have a reasonably hard deadline, uh, so we'll get uh, straight into some uh, questions, a couple uh, from uh, me, and then we'll try and get into uh, the audience, if that's okay. Uh, Dr. Jaishankar, you mentioned your remarks that you have just come from Fiji. Mm -hmm. uh, with India's near region considered to be the Indian Ocean countries, can you give us your assessment of the Pacific, what it means to India, and what you see as opportunities for India-Australia collaboration? Well, uh, you know, if I were to speak about the Pacific broadly, one of the big changes which has happened in India over the last three decades is that the bulk of our trade has actually shifted eastwards. It's more than 50% of our trade today is to countries east of India. Obviously, most of them are Pacific countries. Uh, and that's, in a way, uh, a huge shift from the uh, earlier colonial era uh, trade uh, patterns and routings, uh, which were centered around the Western coast and to European and uh, Middle Eastern markets. Uh, specifically where the Pacific Islands are concerned, because I was in Fiji. Uh, again, uh, uh, these are, uh, this is a region where uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, some history. I, I think the first set of Indian immigrants came to Fiji, for example, I think in 1879. Uh, there's a large Fijian Indian community there. Uh, so one part of our interest is obviously the historical cultural linkages. But in recent years, as our own, you know, we have ourselves globalized, globalized in thinking of our interests in global terms, uh, we actually created a forum called Forum for India Pacific Island uh, Cooperation. Uh, we've had two meetings. This was done by Prime Minister Modi. It was one of his early initiatives in 2014. Uh, uh, we've done two meetings. We would have done a third, but for the COVID. We hope to do it this year. Uh, and uh, we today have development assistance programs uh, in uh, every one of the Pacific Islands. We were uh, providers of uh, vaccines during COVID uh, to about five of them, if my memory serves me right, five or six of them. Uh, certainly to Fiji, I know, but uh, to a number of others as well. Uh, so I think what you should expect to see uh, is uh, a greater uh, Indian uh, presence, a greater Indian uh, commitment, uh, because it's not just a political commitment, it's also a sustainability commitment, you know, and in many, uh, you know, there are islands where we are active in health, uh, uh, some of them in, uh, we, are, we are getting into education. Uh, so uh, it's, it's therefore uh, a region and a subject where we hope to consult very closely with Australia. Uh, and work together in a way in which our convergences are uh, enhanced. Right. Uh, Minister, you, you see, clearly see the convergences there as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, obviously, our government has had much deeper engagement with the Pacific mm -hmm. as one of our key, perhaps our, perhaps our key foreign policy uh, initiative since May. Uh, but we've also noticed and very much welcome the engagement of like-minded countries in the Pacific and, st and step up. Um, India is one. Uh, I've discussed with my friend Jean-Pierre the potential collaboration uh, for more co co collaboration between Australia and France on climate financing in the Pacific, for example. Um, Germany's just uh, appointed a new ambassador for the Pacific. So we very much welcome all these uh, steps up uh, from step up, steps up, uh, from around the world uh, in, in deeper engagement uh, in the Pacific. And there are key opportunities, I think, for ongoing partnerships of Australia working with countries like India on projects right throughout the Pacific. Lovely. Uh, before uh, asking if uh, the, anyone in the audience uh, has a question uh, on, uh, for the two ministers, uh, Dr. Jashangu, a lot of your commentary uh, was um, uh, focused on democracy uh, and furthering democracy uh, and different forms of democracy. Uh, there are occasional comments that we see 
uh, on the undermining of democracy in India, and most recently in the context of the BBC, and just yesterday at the Munich Security Conference, uh, George Soros spoke on, on many issues, mm -hmm. uh, but specifically uh, on open and closed societies and called on uh, institutional reform uh, in India. How do you, as Foreign Minister uh, of India, explain this when you're dealing with your uh, Quad Ministers in particular, as well as others? Well, uh, look, uh, I, I actually made two points. One, how the world is changing. It is rebalancing. It is less Euro-Atlantic. I don't think everybody gets that. I think old habits die hard. I mean, very candidly, uh, there, are, there are still people in the world uh, who believe that uh, uh, their definition, their preferences, their views uh, must override everything else. So, since you mentioned this specific example, I, I don't know how familiar people are with uh, what was said at the Munich conference. Essentially, Mr. Soros said India is a democratic country, but he doesn't think the Prime Minister of India is a Democrat. Uh, and uh, by the way, a few years ago, uh, in the same conference, I was there at that time, he actually accused us of uh, planning to strip millions of Muslims of their citizenship, which of course didn't happen. It was a ridiculous suggestion. But you have to understand what this actually means. Uh, I could take a view that the individual in question, Mr. Soros, is a uh, old, rich, opinionated person sitting in New York who still thinks that his views should determine how the entire world works. Now, if I could only stop at old, rich, and opinionated, I would put it away. But he is old, rich, opinionated, and dangerous. You know, because what happens is when such people and such views and such organizations, they actually invest resources in shaping narratives. You know, I, I spoke about globalization. Now, what globalization does is it actually creates a lot of uh, the seamlessness of globalization, which creates all the opportunities, also allows, you know, narratives to be shaped, money to come in, uh, you know, uh, foundations uh, to go about their, their agenda. Now, in this particular case, I mean, it is very clear that he has very strong political preferences. He actually thinks that, I mean, doesn't matter that this is a country of 1.4 billion people, we are almost there, uh, uh, who, whose voters decide how the country should run. He actually thinks, well, if, you know, uh, and, and again, I cite him as an extreme example, okay? Uh, but it's, uh, it's, there are other, uh, you know, manifestations of this in, in different countries where people like him think, uh, an election is good if the person we want to see wins. If the election throws up a different uh, uh, outcome, then we actually will say it's a flawed democracy. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, this to my... And, and the beauty is all this is done under the uh, pretense of advocacy of open, open society, of transparency, etc. So... Uh, our generation, we have grown up with concepts like regime change, uh, which influence operations. Now, you can call it what you will. I mean, to me, uh, this really looks the same with a gloss uh, of some kind of do-goodism uh, on it. So, for me, it's actually necessary today that you have, we have today, a serious conversation uh, on democracy, you know. Uh, I, I, when I look at my own democracy, I mean, I have today a, a voter turnout which is unprecedented. Uh, electoral outcomes which are decisive. Electoral processes which are not questioned. We are not one of those countries where after the election somebody goes to arbitrate in court. Okay? We don't have any hanging chads either. Huh? Uh, and, you know, where you actually say, uh, I will sit in judgment over 
the verdict of voters. Now, my sense of democracy is the voters are supposed to decide. And it worries us. It worries us because, look, we are a country which went through colonialism. We know the dangers of what happens when there's outside interference in whatever guise uh, in your politics. If, if you do this kind of scaremongering, like millions of people will be deprived of citizenship, it actually does real damage to a societal fabric. Because somebody out there believes you. And somebody, and you don't leave it to accident, by the way, you back it up with an operation. So you create that kind of fear psychosis. And then you use that to validate your original judgment. So I, I do think today between, you know, what, whose democracy, whose globalization, uh, why, you know, the transparency of how uh, global processes work. These are real issues which need to be debated. Thank you, uh, Mr. I was uh, was going to uh, ask you a uh, renewable energy question, but uh, with with timing, uh, might get one from the audience anyway. If it's okay, I'll uh, uh, got a couple of hands up. I think the Australia India Business Council uh, had a uh, had the first question. Kind of. Um, I represent the Australia India Chamber of Commerce. Chamber of Commerce. Um, Apologies. Thank you. Anyway, um, also a worthy body, uh, and thank you to both speakers. Um, uh, uh, I have a question for Minister Bowen. Um, India is a, as we know, a rapidly growing and developing nation and it has a great and growing energy needs and I think currently has about 20 nuclear reactors. Am I right? Something like that. Um, we have 37 nuclear reactors. 37. Okay. I, I think so. I mean, I... Okay. I that's more, more than I thought. Yeah. Um, at one point, Australia did export uranium to India. Um, is there any thought or any possibility, given that we export to other nations, that exports to uranium could go to India? Well, there's certainly no, um, no impediment in terms of uh, political party decisions um, once all the necessary arrangements have been made. Um, uh, so I wouldn't have envisaged any change in approach on a change of government on that matter. It's simply just working the issues through. Um, but certainly there's absolutely no... Um, no, I think, uh, imperative if the all the legal requirements under Australian law and Australian international obligations could be met. Um, but I think there are certain treaty obligations which also need to be considered, uh, which we would have to honour and we would have to be satisfied to, uh, of. Um, and that's, a, that's a standard requirement across all trading partners. That's not a specific comment in relation to India. I saw Gordon Flake all the way from Perth for the uh, Rosina at Sydney. Fantastic to have you here, Gordon. Delighted to make sure that we've got coverage from Australia's Indian Ocean capital. Um, Gordon Flake with the Perth US Asia Centre. Uh, a question from Minister Jai Shankar. I wonder if I might get your reaction to the comments that Minister Bowen made uh, about the importance of renewable energy supply chains and his focus on India as a trusted and reliable partner par excellence. Uh, we had last year both your military colleagues, Minister Joshi, uh, Minister Goyal, uh, visit uh, in October. The Japanese Prime Minister visited Western Australia uh, with an intense focus on those clean energy supply chains with the notion that the road to future energy went through Australia. I wonder if you might address and respond to Minister Bowen's comments in terms of how India views Australia when it comes to energy security and future energy. You know, uh I'm a kind of, I'm not an energy guy, but I'm a sort of jack of all trades. So I'll, I'll have a shot at the answer. Uh, my sense is a lot of countries are re-looking at their energy future. Uh, they're re-looking at the energy future uh, for some of the reasons which Minister Bowen spoke about. That there's today a great deal of anxiety on the fossil fuel on the accessibility, on the affordability, on the volatility of those markets. Uh, there's worry when it comes to renewables that, you know, are we uh, excessively dependent on particular geographies? And, you know, there could be disruptions there, but there could be leveraging there, call it what you will, but dependence is dependence. So, uh, to my mind, what happens and what has happened even in the past when the world starts getting nervous about a particular set of concerns, there's almost an intuitive 
sense in the world that let's go out there and look for different solutions, different arrangements, uh, different transactions, which will, as I said, de-risk all of us. I think when we, in our, in our case, we are thinking about it very actively. We know we are not the only country which is thinking about it. It's also been a subject of conversation in the Quad, uh, in, in other, other formats as well, I would say. Uh, and certainly we see Australia as a particularly important partner here uh, because, uh, you know, if, if the future, we see the future as more renewable, we see the future as more nuclear, we see the future as more green hydrogen, green ammonia. Now, each of these, we, we see you know, EV will mean the capital letters will become stronger with the passage of time. Oh, many of these roads do lead to Australia. So I do think that the energy side of our relationship, but I wouldn't put it just as energy. I would really put it as a kind of an economic security side of the relationship, really uh, growing in, in times to come. Uh, Minister Bowen, do you want to respond to any of that, your line of energy security needs, supply chain security, I think was uh, very important. Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure I can add too much to what I said at the podium. And um, I do think it is, in many senses, issue one, two and three for energy ministers around the world. Um, it would just be, it, it is just unthinkable to, for this important transition to be reliant on a geographically specific supply chain as we are. And I think of things which could slow down our transition to renewables. I can think of a few. When I think of things which could stop our transition to renewables, I can really only think of one. And that is the disruption to supply chains uh, from for solar panels, batteries, inverters, electrolyzers, all the above. I mean, I just, it, it could stop us. And so we need to diversify as a matter of great urgency. Great. I think we have one more question uh, before needing to uh, um, uh, you go on to your next uh, meetings it might require uh, short answers, uh, but please go ahead. Jasmine Crawford-Hill from the Australia-India Youth Dialogue. Um, we've heard about democratising and diversifying manufacturing and supply chains, but nothing about the beginning of that cycle, about the need to democratise and potentially diversify R&D and who holds IP. And I think we did start to see this through COVID with vaccines and access. Uh, what does it look like if we talk about embedding values and culture, not just into our manufacturing and supply chains, but into our research? Then is there a need for us to lead the region in democratising research as well? We, we, we already share our R&D with the world. A little bit too much for my liking sometimes. Because <laughs> um, the modern solar panel was invented, as I said, in Randwick. Uh, literally the perk... Um, technology, which is in 98% of the world's solar panels, came from the University of New South Wales in collaboration with the Australian National University. Uh, but we have exported all the expertise to turning that into manufacturing, uh, in, and, not a, and not in a good way, in that we, don't, we, we manufacture a small number of solar panels in Australia. 1% uh, of the solar panels we use are made in Australia. Uh, but they're all invented in Australia and all the, almost all the solar panels around the world are in effect a modern Australian invention in the latest technology. Now, there's some uh, good science uh, arising out of the University of New South Wales is the latest research, which is replacing copper with silver uh, inside the solar panel, which much to our friend, uh, Dr. Jashanka's ministerial colleague and my friend R.K. Singh's delight, um, is now the most efficient solar panel in the world and can potentially be scaled up to production and are looking to produce it in Australia. Um, so that there are all big steps forward, but I, I don't think there's any problem with sharing Australian IP. Uh, I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's gone a bit too far the other way. You know, uh, from an Indian perspective, this is a very valid question because it's been a big source of concern for us when it comes to policy making. Uh, a sense that we are underinvested in R&D. Uh, and we are. Uh, I think a large part of the problem derives from the fact that we are underinvested in manufacturing. So you can't, you know, you can't have a strong R&D economy and a weak manufacturing economy. They don't go together. And uh, in previous years, quite honestly, 
uh, we made life difficult for ourselves when it came to manufacturing through a set of policy decisions which were taken. Uh, and uh, a lot of our uh, in inabilities and uh, uh, shortcomings were actually rationalized saying, you know, we are Indians, our real strength is in services, which was a good cop out of what you failed to do. That is today getting addressed. Uh, so if you look at the last few years, there's been a huge push uh, to expand and intensify manufacturing. There's even the, the HR support, I mean, uh, the, the emphasis on skills, on vocational education, on innovation, on startups, on patents. This is almost like a new culture uh, which, is, which is taking place. And uh, I can see it actually taking root. You know, I, I, I visit a lot of educational institutions uh, uh, across India. Uh, ten years ago, if I went somewhere, they would trot out the best five students and say, you know, these are the gold medalists of our institution. Today, they say, you know, give us half an hour. We want to put a display and we want to introduce you to five people who hold patents while they're still studying in the university. That, to me, is a big mindset shift. I accept that we have a long way to go there. I, I think uh, the prime minister and the government uh, knows that. Uh, uh, but it is today a course correction that we have made. I think we have made that very decisively. Uh, we now need to really intensify it. Uh, we have this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, initiative called Production Linked Incentive Program, which is designed to actually get uh, for, you know, countries to come in, collaborate with us. Uh, I'm hearing more and more uh, you know, anecdotal evidence uh, of global companies setting R&D up in India. We're trying to make it easier for them. Uh, so, yes, work in progress, but honestly, a lot of work to be done. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, Minister Jashank and Minister Bowen, thank you for uh, being uh, the ministers involved with the inaugural uh, Rosina uh, at Sydney. Uh, from foreign policy to climate policy to energy security and democracy and how technology impacts all of them. Uh, it has shown the breadth uh, and importance of the Australia-India relationship. So uh, uh, please, uh, let's thank both ministers. Thank you.